Hey everybody, welcome back to Race of History. Today we're doing the Russian Revolution by Oversimplified Part 2. Let's get into it. While Nicholas had been busy playing with his new best friend, tensions in Europe had been rising. It just so happened that in 1914, one Archduke Franz Ferdinand of Austria-Hungary went for a drive with the top down in Sarajevo. One thing leads to another, and suddenly Russia found itself at war with half of Europe. A wave of patriotism swept through Russia. The capital was renamed to Petrograd because St. Petersburg sounded a bit too German. Even revolutionaries were getting on board. To them, World War I was a big stinky imperialist war, but they didn't want their big stinky imperialist replaced by a foreign one. So pretty much everyone wanted Russia to win. I hope Russia loses. Geez, read the room, Lenin. Lenin hoped Russia would lose because that would help him overthrow the Tsar. As long as he did that, who cares if Germany blows up? And there are a handful of notable socialists at the time who kind of share this opinion. They are historically anti-war, but they think that World War I will bring about the social change to allow for the socialist revolution throughout Europe. So these historically anti-war socialists become pro-war, and Mussolini is one of these anti-war to, to pro-war socialists. Up half the country and blow up half the country, they did. An inefficient czarist government meant there were shortages of just about everything you need to fight a war. And if losing a teensy-weensy war with Japan upset the people, losing a giant Wyatt war like this was much worse. Soldiers were deserting, the economy was imploding, and in no time, Russia was starving. The peasants were getting more peasanty, the workers were getting more workery, all the while Germany was getting more Germanery. Dimitri, we need to win this war. I need someone with a great military mind to step in and take control. You're right. How about General Hickelooper? How about me? You can't run the war. Who'll be in charge of the country while you're gone? Obviously, my German wife and a homeless wizard. Duh. Nicholas declared himself commander-in-chief and went to the front lines, leaving his German wife in charge while they were fighting, the Germans. It wasn't a good look. And because Alexander was so close to Rasputin, people believed that he was actually calling the shots and secretly destroying Russia, and maybe even boinking her. An even worser look. At this point, a bunch of nobles just couldn't take it anymore. Rasputin is destroying the country. We have to break his magic spell over the Tsar. But how? He's magic. Hmm. Hmm, 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 Dude. Very cool. Hey, it's Rasputin. The sexy party is running a little late, but in the meantime, why don't you try one of these totally not poisoned cakes? Dude, why'd you say it like that? He's totally gonna know they're poisoned now. Shut up. I said they're not poisoned. Dude. He just ate so much poison. How is he still alive? It must be the magic. Go with plan B. Is he dead? <laughs> See, Boris? I told you he was the Antichrist and you didn't believe me. Can you shut up for one minute and help me roll him up? Are you sure he's dead? I don't know, but I'm supposed to be hosting a charity auction right now. Can we get this over with? There is a lot of dispute on how exactly Rasputin died how much of the story is actually true. But the official story or the story that we get passed to us is, yeah, essentially this, you know, minus the Antichrist floating around the room. Okay, now he's dead. Think you're a good driver? Now's your chance to prove it with Karma Drive. The murder of Rasputin, just like his life, is shrouded in mystery and speculation. He probably didn't really die like that, but he also probably didn't really heal people. He probably didn't influence the Tsar as much as people thought. He probably wasn't secretly destroying the country. But what he definitely did do, even in his death, was ruin the Tsar's reputation. Russia's autocracy looked more outdated than ever, and the Russian people were taking notice. Come on, men. Remember what we're fighting for. Yeah, no. We're out. World War I left Russia broke, hungry, and exhausted. And with Nicholas acting as commander-in-chief, he was getting even more blame. For the second time, Russia was on the brink of revolution. By 1917, Russia had been fighting a war it couldn't afford for three years. They were running out of many things, most worryingly, food. On International Women's Day 1917, thousands of hungry women in Petrograd were so sick of being hungry that they took to the streets. And it turns out it's not just women who experience hunger, but men too. So the next And this is kind of common for women to come out and lead the social change or start the revolutions. It's it's not an uncommon thing at all. 
And in this case, yeah, it was women that started this protest that eventually will turn into a full-blown revolution. They, they joined in as well. Gatherings on the streets were forbidden, but I'm not sure how you'd arrest 250,000 people. The crowds demanded an end to the war, an end to food rationing, and even an end to the Tsar's autocracy. Now, normally the troops would deal with this kind of thing, but as it turns out, soldiers get hungry too, and they were also tired of having to kill their fellow Russians so much. So entire regiments mutinied in the capital, and they joined the crowd as well, trashing symbols of the Tsar and his autocratic regime. Leon Trotsky has a quote that I love that's about this. It is, let me see if I can get it real quick. It's one of my favorite historical quotes, and it's written from the point of the revolution. So it's while the revolution's happening, and it's in terms of the soldiers. And here is the quote. To bring the soldiers from a deep but as yet hidden revolutionary discontent to overt mutinous action, or at least first to a mutinous refusal to act. That was the task. On the third day of the struggle, the soldiers totally ceased to be able to maintain a benevolent neutrality towards the insurrection. Only accidental fragments of what happened in those hours along the line of contact between workers and soldiers have come down to us. We heard how yesterday the workers complained passionately to the Pavlovsky Regiment about the behavior of its training squad. Such scenes, conversations, reproaches, appeals were occurring in every corner of the city. The soldiers had no more time for hesitation. They were compelled to shoot yesterday, and they would be again today. The workers will not surrender or retreat. Under fire, they are still holding their own. And with them, their women, wives, mothers, sisters, and sweethearts. Yes, and this is the very hour they had so often whispered about. If only we could all get together. In the moment of supreme agony, in the unbearable fear of the coming day, the choking hatred of those who are imposing upon them the executioner's role, there ring out in the barrack room the first voices of open in indignation, and in those voices, to be forever nameless, the whole army with relief and rapture recognizes itself. Thus dawned upon the earth the day of the destruction of the Romanov monarchy. So... Like I said in the last Russian Revolution video, part one of this, if you have the police, if you have the military on your side as an autocracy, then you're okay. You can handle things. But the second, the second that the police and military turn on you, it's over. And so one of the things that the military struggles with is they are brought in to essentially put down the revolution. And as they are starting to be asked to fire on the crowd, it, it immediately turns them against those who would give them the role of executioner. And the Romanov dynasty completely loses the military. And at that point, it's over. It's, it's over. The Tsar is essentially overthrown at this point. Things were escalating very quickly. Liberal politicians watching the riots in the streets had long been dissatisfied with the Tsar, since he would shut their parliament down anytime they did something he didn't like. They believed the only way to bring stability back to the streets was for Nicholas II to abdicate. The riots continued. The police fired on soldiers. Soldiers fired on soldiers. The workers re-established the Petrograd Soviet. Politicians began arresting the Tsar's ministers. He may have been an autocrat, but he just lost complete control of his capital city. And he's not even in the capital. He's he's not even there to help or look over things. And so his wife, who is German, when they're fighting the Germans in World War I, is in control. And Rasputin has sway until he is killed. And he puts essentially a ruthless overseer to look over the city while he's gone. And the, the guy he puts in control has a quote in this in regards to what to do about the protesters. And his quote is something along the lines of, do you know how marvelous machine guns work from the roof? And so that was the attitude of the monarchy at this time. And Nicholas is not even there to help smooth over the situation. Talk about embarrassing. Nicholas, the troops have turned against us. The people have taken over the city. They've even cut my phone line. Hello? Hello? Hmm, the phones are down. 
Things must be bad. I'd better go back there. Nicholas hopped on the next train back to Petrograd, but he never made it to the city. His train was met by military generals and other politicians. What's going on? Nicholas, look man, we need to talk. It's not you, it's us. Ah, oh, who am I kidding? No, it's definitely you. During the whole crisis in Petrograd, the liberals convinced the generals that if Nicholas abdicated, the people would calm down, and the generals were on board. A lot of people were scared of what was going on here. There's a lot of writing from this time period where essentially they're saying that the, the liberals in the Duma and the generals don't really want a full-blown revolution, but they don't really know how to stop it. And so they're trying to do their best here to kind of smooth everything over and calm things down. And so they come up with the idea that if Nicholas abdicates, that that will be enough change, that things will calm down, people will stop killing each other in the streets, and things will somewhat go back to normal. They didn't have time to quell the chaos, because don't forget, they were still losing a global, all-encompassing war against the Germans. And with the military no longer on his side, Nicholas had no choice but to step down. Throughout his entire reign, he had done everything he could to keep all the power for himself. And in the end, that's exactly what left him with none. But then there was a big question. Who would replace Nicholas? Well, his son Alexei was next in line. Hey buddy, daddy couldn't handle the complex socioeconomic problems of a giant multinational, multi-ethnic empire that's engaged in total war with all of Europe. You think you could give it a shot? Alexei just wasn't ready to be czar. Nicholas did have a brother, but given the state of the empire, he wasn't keen either. And so, 300 years of Romanov rule in Russia just kind of came to an end. The earlier 1905 revolution hadn't changed much, but this new revolution had left Russia without a czar. And still, before the year was over, there would be one more revolution left to come. Nicholas's failure as commander of the armed forces was the final straw that broke the camel's back. Do you think maybe you could have done any better? Well, guess what? It's time to find out in Rise of Kingdoms. Rise of Kingdoms is an epic, massive multiplayer, free-to-play, real-time strategy game. Choose from 11 historical civilizations, including Rome, China, or France. You can form alliances with... Now, where was I? Oh, yeah. Hungry Woman, Absolute Chaos, and the End of the Tsar. Oh, hey guys, says here there's been a revolution and the reign of the czars has ended. Oh, come on, I missed another one? Why am I even in this video? Well, it's not like you could have done anything. As long as there's a world war, you can't get back to Russia. Who wants to start a revolution? I mean, a revolution. Dang it! Despite getting rid of Nick, Russia was still at war with half of Europe. The Germans, however, had an idea. They thought that if they helped Lenin get back, he would cause trouble for the new Russian government. So they put him on a train. Destination, Petrograd. It was a long journey, and while Lenin was cooped up in his train, things in Russia were changing. Workers were taking control of their factories. Soldiers were socking it to their mean old officers. Without a czar, a big old power vacuum had opened up, and someone needed to fill it. The liberals... I think this was a drastic miscalculation by the Germans. I know that they eventually end up getting out of the war, Russia does. However... It looked like it was going that direction anyway. And if the Duma was going to maintain any legitimacy, my opinion is they were going to have to get out of the war. So Germany sending Lenin back to Russia, I believe actually does more harm than good long term for Germany. The proposed they be in charge, and they set up the provisional government. The workers, however, had already begun establishing local Soviets, largely controlled by the social revolutionaries and the Mensheviks. And since neither felt like they had the power to oust the other, Russia ended up in a classic dual power conundrum. The two coexisted, with the provisional government becoming the official government, and the elected Soviets issuing orders to the workers and soldiers. This power balance was delicate, and all it would take is one bold revolutionary to come along and give everyone a big-brained beatdown. Oh boy, Lenin's coming home. I can't wait for him to see all the great things we've accomplished. And I'm gonna show him my fan art. Oh look, here he comes now. Shut up, shut up! You all suck! The provisional government sucks, the Soviet sucks, even your fan art sucks! <laughs> Why does he have to be so mean? 
In case you couldn't tell, Lenin wasn't a fan of everything that had been happening. In his April theses, he called the provisional government and the Soviets a bunch of big bourgeois bozos. And he kind of had a point. There was still a lot for the Russian people to be mad about. The provisional government hadn't got Russia out of the war, the people were still hungry, and the peasants were still hoping to get more land. Meanwhile, the Soviets hadn't done much to change things either. But even though they weren't perfect, a lot of people did like what the new government had been doing. There was progress. The secret police were disbanded, the death penalty abolished. They even planned to hold elections, meaning for the first time ever, the Russian people could choose their own government. To many, Lenin seemed like some out-of-touch weirdo. If Lenin wanted to go from whiny irrelevant zero to hunky communist hero, he'd need to shake things up a bit. So he and the Bolsheviks came up with a hot new slogan that promised to give the people what the provisional government wouldn't. Peace. Don't like war? We'll end it. Land. You want land? We'll give it to you. Bread. Hungry? Scooby dooby doo. Lenin also called for all power to the Soviets, which meant getting rid of the provisional government and having the Soviets run the place. A communist dream. The people liked these slogans, and bit by bit, the Bolsheviks became more popular. Some Mensheviks even began switching sides. But even though the people thought Lenin's slogans rocked, as long as the provisional government didn't mess up, they'd continue to support it. So let's check in on the provisional government. Oh, provisional government, you've made a big mess. The provisional government lasted for just nine months, but those nine months were chaos. The people wanted Russia out of World War I, but Minister of War Alexander Kerensky thought instead of doing that, why not do the exact opposite? And that's a huge deal. That is one of the big issues that goes back to the revolution is Russia has no resources. They have no food, they have no money, they have no anything because the war has just taken a giant vacuum and just sucked all of the resources out of Russia. And so everybody wants to get out of the war. And the the Duma just won't do it. And it it drastically hurts their chances of maintaining power. If the people saw more Russian victories, they'd have to support the new government. And that went just about as well as you might expect. These heavy defeats worsened the Russian economy and made the hungry people hungrier. And by now, I think you know what comes next. They trashed the place. More looting, more rioting, more violence. It was like the Tsar had never abdicated. Tens of thousands of armed workers took to the streets during some of the worst violence Petrograd had seen yet. And in response, Kerensky called in the troops who opened fire on the demonstrators. For now, Lenin and other Bolshevik leaders wanted to distance themselves from the violence, but the crowds marched under Bolshevik slogans. And as a result, Kerensky, now the prime minister, took the opportunity to stamp down on the Bolsheviks. Their leaders were arrested. Lenin was accused of being a German agent, and he was forced to flee to Finland in disguise. This sucks. Now I'll never get to have my revolution. Why are you wearing a dress? It's a disguise, idiot. And it makes me feel pretty. Kerensky had successfully dealt with the violence, but he just couldn't catch a break. This increasing support for more extreme forms of socialism, along with the poor handling of the war, alarmed traditional liberals and bougie business boys. To appease them, Kerensky decided to promote a military legend to supreme commander of the armed forces. Someone who hated the revolution, loved the death penalty, and was devoutly anti-socialist, General Kornilov. And that's going to be a major issue because Kornilov has a lot of ambition, and so that's going to play a role later on. Hey man, thanks for the promotion. That was real swell of you. Of course, with you by my side, who would dare try to overthrow me? How about me? Yeah. I did not see this coming. Unfortunately for Kerensky, Kornilov hated the liberal and socialist reforms of the new government, particularly the dumb socialist soldiers' committees. The army was no place for undisciplined left-wing snowflakes. Fearing a Bolshevik takeover was imminent, Kornilov ordered his men towards Petrograd to oust the Soviet and take over. Kerensky freaked out, and he needed help. Since he knew Trotsky was finger-licking good at organizing, he and other Bolshevik leaders were released, and they, along with the Soviet, organized the defense of Petrograd. And this infighting between people that are more or less trying to keep the Soviets out of power is going to directly lead to the Soviets getting in power. So it's it's this fighting on one side, the infighting, that will essentially hand the keys to Russia over to the Soviets. Kornilov had the power of soldiers, but the Soviet had the power of workers. And they did what workers do best. Railroad workers diverted Kornilov's men away. Telegraph workers messed with his communications. They even infiltrated his forces and encouraged the demoralized men to desert. They were also armed en masse. But in the end, no fighting was necessary because Kornilov's coup just fell apart. And Kornilov was sent straight to prison. 
Everything was coming up Kerensky. Hey, thanks for the help, boys. Couldn't have done it without you. Now that there's no longer any threat, how about you, uh, return all those guns I gave you? Hmm. <laughs> nah. No. In order to kill a rat, Kerensky had just given a gun to a bear, a Bolshevik bear. The whole affair was a huge propaganda win for them. They had defended the revolution, and their popularity skyrocketed. They found themselves elected to the Petrograd and Moscow Soviets, with Trotsky even becoming chairman in Petrograd. They were now in a very powerful position, almost powerful enough for Lenin to return home from Finland and finally stage his long-awaited communist revolution. The Bolsheviks began planning their takeover of the Russian government. Some got cold feet and began arguing against Lenin's armed revolution in favor of a more peaceful approach. And they even wrote newspaper articles about it, which kind of gave the whole scheme away. The Bolsheviks are planning an armed revolution? I did not see this coming. Kerensky began arresting Bolsheviks, and as a result, Lenin and the boys felt they had no choice but to commence the revolution right now. Lenin was back in Petrograd, but was still in hiding, so Trotsky got the ball rolling, using his position as Soviet chairman to organize the Bolshevik militias. Now, if you were to ask Soviet artists, the revolution went something like this. As much as they would like you to think it was a glorious, violent, heroic takeover, the truth seems to be a little more underwhelming. The Bolsheviks just kind of walked into key buildings in the city and took control. Bolshevik supporting sailors even brought in a huge battleship, but there wasn't really any fighting. Nobody really tried to stop them. In just one day, they took... It's because at this point, there is very little support for the government. And because you just had the Soviets who came in and, well, you just had the Bolsheviks come in and protect Petrograd, then they have the support at this point. And so because they have the popular support and the provincial government does not, there really is no need for fighting. The, the government, when the Soviets come in, they, they know what time it is. They know what's going on. Control of the city. Next, Kerensky just managed to escape before the Bolsheviks surrounded the Winter Palace, placing the provisional government under siege inside. Is it safe to come out yet? I think so. Fear my revolutionary might. Give me that. That night, Lenin came out of hiding to play a bigger role in the revolution. With him back at the helm, they had one more job to do. Storm the Winter Palace and arrest the provisional government. And here comes the final showdown. The palace was defended by a force known as the Battalion of Death, who immediately gave up. And just like that, Lenin had won. As far as violent, bloody revolutionary uprisings go, this wasn't really one of them. But Lenin was finally in charge of Russia. He had spent his whole life dreaming of this moment. He set up the first Council of People's Commissars, his own cabinet, with him in charge. This was it, his chance to finally make his communist utopia with equality and freedoms beyond compare. Hey Lenin, before we took power, they were planning on holding elections. Shall we go ahead with those? Of course, you can't have a communist utopia without high levels of political participation. The proletariat should be free to we elect lost. who What? The social revolutionaries won. We lost. Those don't count. Lenin claimed the elections were unfair, and the constituent assembly they created was counter-revolutionary. He presented the new assembly with a motion that basically said, sign here and give up your power. And when the assembly was like, no, Lenin said, see, they're disobeying me. Proof they're counter-revolutionary. Shut it down, boys. Moderate socialists and others weren't happy when Lenin had the assembly closed by force. And when campaigners began taking to the streets, they were fired upon. For Lenin, setting up a communist utopia was looking suspiciously like setting up a dictatorship. Yep, that's exactly right. He comes in, and there are things that are different from the way that they were under the Tsar, but the total control that the Tsar had essentially just goes right to Lenin. And so he's able to take power away from the Duma. He's you know, putting down protests or riots. He can basically do whatever he wants, and he essentially just fills the shoes of the Tsar under his communist ideals. While he was implementing many of the communist policies you'd expect, he was also refusing to work with other political parties and cracking down on opposition. Hey Lenin, are you setting up a dictatorship? I'll shoot you if you are. Of course not. What a crazy theory. Anyway. I'm pleased to announce I'm setting up a secret police force to repress and kill traitors. And by traitors, I of course mean anyone not loyal to me. 
Owie, 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 owie. The assassination attempt made on Lenin's life in August 1918 failed, but in response, the Bolsheviks ramped up their oppression. But while all of this chaos was erupting back home, Lenin and the boys were also distracted by another problem. They were still at war with the Germans, and they had promised to give the people peace. So Lenin made Trotsky Commissar for foreign affairs, and sent him off to negotiate a peace deal with the Germans. The peace deal that they work out is notorious historically for being one of the worst peace deals ever. They Russia just gets hammered in this deal by the Germans, and the Germans get outrageously great terms for the peace. The Germans offered Trotsky really harsh terms, you know, because they were winning the war. They demanded Russia give up a butt-ton of land, something that would be devastating to the economy. Look, I know it's not great, but I think we have to accept it. Are you insane? This will ruin us! Hey Trotsky, you got a big brain. What do you think? How about no war, no peace? What's that, Mr. Trotsky, sir? It's simple. No war means we'll stop fighting the Germans, but no peace means we won't sign the peace treaty either. Then, when the Germans say we've just stopped fighting, they'll have to leave us alone or something. Trotsky, that's genius. I could kiss you. Do you want me to kiss you? Stop asking me that. Trotsky's no war, no peace plan was a huge success. Oh, wait, no, just kidding. It went exactly as you'd imagine. When the Germans saw the Russians had stopped fighting, they slammed 700,000 troops deep into Russian territory with no resistance. Now, the new peace treaty offered by the Germans was way worse, with Russia losing a huge amount of territory, population, and resources. The Bolsheviks had no choice but to accept, and Russia was humiliated. With Petrograd now in an exposed position, Lenin moved the capital to Moscow, just in case. Things really weren't going well for Lenin, and many, many people were extremely unhappy with the Bolshevik government and its actions. Lenin, you've pissed off so many people that they've united against you. We're under attack. Relax, we always expected some counter-revolutionary pushback. I think we can handle a few angry Monopoly men. But Lenin, it's not just the Monopoly men. Okay, who are we up against? Well, the liberals, the social revolutionaries, national separatists in Poland, Finland, and the Ukraine, independent warlords setting up chiefdoms, anarchist rebels, the green peasant armies, the Cossacks, the Caucasian states, the Baltic states, the British, the French, the Americans, and the Japanese. Oh, and a legion of Czechoslovakian soldiers seem to have taken over the Trans-Siberian Railway and stolen all the imperial gold reserves. What? How could this get any worse? Oh, and it says here your mother-in-law is coming to stay. <laughs> no! A variety of anti-Bolshevik forces had united together to topple Lenin's government, and Russia descended into a full-blown civil war. Now, the Russian civil war was extremely intricate and would really need its own video, but essentially, the anti-Bolshevik white movement gained control of vast, underdeveloped areas, while the Bolshevik Reds controlled the industrial heartland. Using this to their advantage, along with the surprising military genius of Trotsky and the shocking disorganization of the White Army, the fortified Red Army gradually came out on top. It was an absolutely brutal conflict, with both sides committing horrendous atrocities. To maintain order at home, the Bolsheviks began the Red Terror, and the secret police would execute tens of thousands of suspected traitors. No one was safe from the violence, not even Nicholas himself. You've probably been wondering what Nicholas has been up to this whole time. Well, after his abdication, he and his family were placed under house arrest. At first, they were allowed to live in their usual luxury, but after Lenin took over, their conditions worsened. The Bolsheviks were just holding on to Nick until they could work out what to do with him, but the Civil War complicated things. The last thing they wanted was for Nick to be freed by the White Armies, and so, to stop this from happening... Yep, because their fear is, is that the White Army is going to free Nicholas, and then if you have a deposed king that is still wandering around somewhere, there's a chance, always, that they can just step right back in and take the throne. And so that's the fear here, is that as long as Nicholas is alive, he, he poses a threat to the revolutionary and new Russian ideas for the Bolsheviks. Nicholas's Bolshevik guards decided to act. It's not entirely certain whether Lenin ordered it, or if the guards were acting on their own volition. But on July 17th, 1918, with white armies approaching, they woke Nicholas and his family in the middle of the night and brought them into the basement. There, a, a drunken, drunken squad of Bolsheviks murdered the entire family. Nicholas, the last czar, once one of the most powerful men alive, had met a brutal end. But after years of fighting and millions of deaths, Trotsky and his Red Army came out victorious. Wow, that was a close one. Okay, back to creating a communist utopia. 
How are we doing on that? Well, the Civil War helped create a massive famine and about 5 million people starved to death. There's massive inflation and the ruble is worthless. Hundreds and hundreds of kilometers of railway track have been destroyed. Disease and epidemics have killed 3 million. The population of Moscow and Petrograd has collapsed. Life expectancy has plummeted. Sailors in Kronstadt are rebelling. People are freezing to death in their own apartments and life has been reduced to a constant search for food and shelter. Whoa. Well, this just means I'll have to work twice as hard, day and night, to save the country. Nothing will stop me, short of a couple sudden strokes. Get the doctor. One thing you have to keep in mind is that everything I've been talking about, the civil war, the assassination attempt, and Lenin's struggle to maintain control at home, were all happening around the same time. And it must have been extremely stressful. Lenin began getting headaches, insomnia, and in 1922, he suffered two separate strokes. As the Soviet Union was officially declared under a strict one-party system, Lenin's health continued to decline, and his ability to lead the Communist Party went with it. Everybody assumed Trotsky would succeed him. He was a great speaker, he'd won the Civil War, and he had a dope-ass train. The last person anyone expected to take over was Stalin. Stalin wasn't a great intellectual like Lenin, or a charismatic war hero like Trotsky. He was, as one Menshevik described him, a gray blur. Someone who operated in the background. Someone who you might not even notice. But it was in the background that Stalin would rise to power. Here's how it happened. After the revolution, all the Bolsheviks hoped to get a cool job in the new government. What did you get? Commissar for war. Sweet. What'd you get? Secretary. <laughs> Stalin was made general secretary for the Communist Party. It wasn't what he wanted, but Stalin quickly realized that even though it wasn't fancy, it was a powerful position. As secretary, he had the power to give people jobs within the party. So he would give jobs to all of his pals, who in turn would give him their support. The more pals he gave jobs, the more power he got. The more power he got, the more pals he got. Lenin may have been having wall-to-wall -wall strokes, but he was still involved in the party, and he was taking notice. He wasn't a fan of Stalin abusing his position, or insulting his wife to her face. Lenin knew he couldn't let Stalin take over, but by this stage, he was just too sick to fight it. Hey man, tell whoever's in charge of giving people jobs not to let that jerk Stalin become the next leader. By the way, who did I put in charge of giving people jobs? That would be Stalin, sir. Blah. Whoa. Deja vu. Lenin's last wish was to not let Stalin take over, but by the time he died, Stalin was too powerful to remove. He had his remaining opponents arrested or killed. Trotsky was banished and fled to Europe. Eventually, he would be assassinated by Soviet spies in 1940. Our dear comrade Lenin has died. We should have a state funeral. No. Let's mummify him and put him on display so people can look at his dead body forever. That's gross. You're gross. Guards, kill him. Lenin had waited so long to take control in Russia, but he never got to see his communist utopia. His short time in charge was spent dealing with the destroyed Russian economy, World War I, and the Civil War. He was cruel and merciless, but he really did seem to believe communism would make Russia a better place. Stalin, on the other hand, would take the Soviet Union down a different path. If you thought Lenin was a tyrant, well, you ain't seen nothing yet, girl. A secret police state, a rapidly militarizing superpower led by a paranoid man who deeply distrusted the West would see the world come to the brink of nuclear annihilation. That's right, I'm talking about Remember to click the link in the description below. All right, guys, that was Oversimplifies the Russian Revolution Part 2. Uh, like, comment, and subscribe to the channel. Help me keep building it over here, and I will see you guys next time.